We just wanted to be tenting over here and having fun with it, being out the outside. And then I figured out it started growing. And then I figured out, okay, I've got to take care of it. I need to know how to do it. Um, so I, <laughs> I asked my forester, can you help me? And he said, you can help me with my management plan. And so I learned a lot about that. And then I said, okay, now I'm gonna go back to forestry classes. And so I've taken many or most of the forestry classes at UMaine because I need to know how to take care of it. And that's what I do, and I figure it out. So yeah, I'm not gonna give up. <laughs> I love me forest. <laughs> So my goals would be to have some saw logs taken to a mill. I also want wildlife to be happy here. And that's important to us and our planet. Welcome. My name is Marin Grandstrom, and I'm a research assistant with the University of Maine School of Forest Resources. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll meet with folks working in the Maine forest and learn more about management options and explain some harvesting techniques. We'll touch on wildlife habitat, climate change, and some other considerations. While these examples are from the northern conifer forest of Maine, much of what we'll learn applies to tree species and forest types elsewhere. The U.S. Forest Service has more than 80 long-term research sites nationwide and this is one of those. It was established in 1950. What we're researching out here is silviculture, which is the art and science of managing forests for the outcomes that you want. And we're looking at a full suite of silvicultural treatments. So there's ones that create an even aged forest condition and there's others that create an uneven aged forest condition. And there's a lot of different options between those. And so we're looking at things like clear cutting, shelter wood, thinning, we also have what's called selection cutting, and irregular shelter wood. So these are all different types of silvicultural treatments. And then along with that, we're also looking at what we call exploitive harvests. So exploitive harvests are the result of going into a forest and just taking out what you can sell in the short term without any consideration of the future sustainability of the management. And so by looking at that, full range of different types of silvicultural treatments, we can look at the outcomes of them over many years and identify the pros and cons of each of those options. The decisions we make in the forest today have really profound implications for what will be there in the future. And so whether you choose to do a type of silviculture or a type of exploitive harvesting, you're going to end up with a different condition, not just immediately after the harvest, but for many, many decades in the future. So even age management refers to any technique in which your regeneration, so your next cohort of trees, all gets regenerated at the same time. It means you get all of your crop in at once and you get all of your harvest in at once. This is a shelter wood stand. So this is a stand that was regenerated using even aged management techniques where they left some big trees that acted as seed sources and shade for the regenerating stand and then removed those big trees once the regeneration was established. This stand has been both pre-commercially thinned and commercially thinned. And so what that means is they've come through and they've captured some of the intermediate value. So some of these balsam fir that might die early on are taken out and that's what creates this open condition in here. In contrast, this stand was started at the same time, but has never been pre-commercially thinned or commercially thinned. And you can see that when you look at it, there's a extremely dense, very small stems. You can't see very far, you can't walk very far in it. It does provide some good shelter for certain types of wildlife because it's, it's very dense and closed. But it also doesn't give you a lot of very merchantable products because you have a lot of really small trees. That really limits your options. And if you were to go in and remove a bunch of the trees to create this open structure, 
you're going to lose a lot of the remaining trees to blow down and um, damage and things like that. So there's a lot of trees in here that have already fallen over or are dead and still standing. And it's really, it's a natural stand process because they all grew up together. The smaller trees that were shaded out have died and fallen over. And you can help reduce that by thinning and removing trees as they grow. With stand tending, which is what we call uh, activities like pre-commercial and commercial thinning, there's windows of opportunities that you kind of have to hit, both in terms of markets and in terms of tree biology. And so foresters, I think, are always keeping both those things in their head, the biology, the ecology of forests, and the economics, which is how we make a living. This is an uneven age system, so we have trees of many different ages in the, in the forest all at once. When we come in and harvest, we tend to harvest some of the mature trees, but we're also always harvesting the lower quality trees and the shorter lived species um, to try and favor, favor better trees. So we're harvesting trees in all the diameter classes, from the very big to the very small, based on what our management goals are. This is the kind of forest you cannot create overnight. If you're starting with a forest that's relatively even aged or maybe has two ages or all the trees are the same, you can't turn it into this overnight. But through careful management over a long time, um, you can get it into this, into this condition. It's aesthetic. I think it's aesthetically beautiful. There's a lot going on here. But it's also a place that's produced timber for a long time. Those of us who work in forestry can get pretty specific in our terminology and that can be confusing to folks who aren't themselves foresters. And one example of that is the term selective cutting. So to us, selective cutting means that you just selected what to cut and oftentimes it was the most valuable trees and you didn't really think about what you left behind. Selection cutting is a very specific type of silviculture that's focused on creating and maintaining a stand of many different ages and sizes of trees and that is sustainable forestry. We're helping landowners and foresters see the forest in a little bit different way that can benefit multiple bird species and then along with that other species that use similar type of habitat. We know that many of our bird species are declining dramatically across not just Maine but across the entire continent. We selected 20 species that are representative of those birds and then um, looked at what are the particular forest types they use and what are the particular habitat features that they use within those forests. And those include things like, do you have three layers of vegetation, a healthy full overstory, midstory, and understory? Do you have small gaps in the forest? that are somewhere between a tenth of an acre to two acres in size? Do you have big legacy trees or old trees in your forest? Keep those. If you don't have them, try to grow them by opening up the area around really healthy looking trees that can then grow even bigger. Do you have dead standing trees or snags as we call them that are good habitat for woodpeckers and other species like flying squirrels. You can pack a lot more birds into a, an older forest that has multi-stories and, and multiple age and ages and classes of trees than you can a younger forest. So right now we're standing in an um, area of the forest that has been subjected to what we call exploitive harvesting and this is considered a high grade. So the term high grading when it comes to harvesting means taking all of the most valuable trees. So when we started in the 1950s, this was a mature softwood dominated stand. So lots of big trees, spruce, hemlock were important species here. We came in for the purposes of research at that time and we just cut everything that could be sold. And after the stand grew back in the 1980s, we did it again. 
So today the species composition in this stand is dominated in large part by red maple and a, a single stem red maple, that's what we call a tree that's just growing on its own, can be a, a really nice tree from a timber production perspective. But what we see here is what we call a red maple stump sprout. And red maple stump sprouts often result from past harvesting. It's a, a species that vigorously sends up a bunch of new stems after the main stem has been cut. And many of these, unfortunately, are very poor quality and poor vigor. And so we see an example of that here where these trees have poor form, many of them are dying. And so from uh, a forest management perspective, when we're thinking about using our growing space wisely on trees that we can manage in the future, this isn't a desirable outcome. When we think about this stand, it originally was more than 80% softwoods, so almost completely spruce, hemlock, and fir. To a large extent, the spruce and hemlock are now gone. So they are slow growing, they require a really kind of a moist seed bed in order to regenerate, and so they don't do very well in a large open area. The fir, however, is a much more competitive conifer in this region. It's faster growing, and so that has maintained a good representation here in the stand, but unfortunately, it has a short lifespan. So while the hemlock and the spruce can last 400 years or longer, these fir on these poorly drained sites tend to die at 70 to 80 years old. This is not ideal bird habitat. <laughs> this is that intermediate stage where it's too old for those species that really like super young forest to do well, and it's too young for those species that like older forest to do really well. So you'll definitely get some birds in here, but not nearly the same variety of species or number of individuals as you would in the selection cut. So if a landowner does have a forest like this that's uneven aged and not that old, what are some things that they can do to try to kind of create a more diverse condition or make it better for birds? Well, I think one of the first things that I would suggest would be to go in and do a few small gap openings. Something that could be a, a tenth of an acre patches spread out or maybe one or two larger, quarter acre, half acre, even, uh, so that you, you open up the forest, get some more light in, get some different ages, some different size trees. And then in addition to that, you might want to go in and start thinning out some of the real scrubby stuff so that, and keep the better size trees and the better, the healthier looking trees so that they can grow even bigger and older and eventually turn into good saw logs. And the longer lived species. And the longer lived species, yeah. yeah. So the stand we're in right now was harvested with what's called diameter limit cutting. And specifically we call this fixed diameter limit cutting, which means there's a, a specific or fixed tree size and above that all the trees that are merchantable are harvested and all the trees below that are left. And by removing all the large and most valuable trees and leaving those that are um, poor vigor or unmerchantable and not doing any thinning or what we would call tending in the smaller size classes, over time the quality of the stand and the health of the stand deteriorate. I think there's some misconceptions about sustainable management of stands that have many different ages or sizes of trees. And in a stand where you have, um, let's say, trees of a similar age, those that are bigger are more competitive, they're growing better than the ones that are smaller, that might be of the same age class, they're sort of the losers in the competition. And so if you come into a stand and you remove the large trees, what you're releasing are sort of the trees that were the losers in the race to the sky. And so they're not going to grow as well as if they were young trees. You have to be thoughtful about leaving some of the good trees to provide seed and doing some thinning, which is reducing the stand density in the smaller size classes to give more growing space to the best trees you have there. But that is more complicated than just cutting the largest trees. And I think that 
you know, combination of ease and efficiency and a misunderstanding about the effects of this type of harvesting have led to it being so prevalent. Ecological forestry, the way I define it, and I think most people, is about using nature's template to inform those processes. In the case of the Acadian forests, where we are here, a very diverse place, what we know about it is that it's driven by what's called gap dynamics, where the patches of regeneration are very small within the stand, a tenth of an acre or less typically, driven by windstorms and forest pests. So what we're looking at here is one variant of irregular shelterwood. Now, irregular shelterwood is kind of a hybrid silvicultural system. We think of it as multi-aged, so we're looking at here as one of the small gap treatments. Over a hundred year period, uh, both treatments regenerate in gaps 1% per year. Every 10 years in the, one, the large gap treatment, we cut 20%. We do that five times and then the stand is regenerated. Most importantly, the, one of the hardest things to do in silviculture, if you want to have a light hand and not harvest very much under an ecological paradigm, if you do that one tree at a time scattered around in the whole forest, that's very difficult because of the, especially with the modern harvest machinery, just the trails to get to those trees are going to amount to probably 20 or 25 percent of the area in the stand. Whereas if you group them in these small patches, you can, you can economically harvest 10 percent and maybe with a few little trails, but the trails get reused. So that's a very small investment, just a few percent area, five or six percent of the area of the stand. And it's economic to come in with a large harvester and do that just, uh, if the wood is concentrated like it is in these gaps. So that's a really critical advantage, I think, of these irregular group shelter wood approaches. <laughs> So one of the things we encourage people to do is spend time in their forests. So um, sometimes an example is hemlock woolly adelgid. So people will say, well, you know, all of a sudden the hemlock have died or look sick from hemlock woolly adelgid. And the reality is that in Maine, that is not an all of a sudden. It's, it is a gradual decline. And so if you're actively looking for hemlock woolly adelgid on a regular basis, you're going to find it before there's any significant sign of decline. And so um, it's getting out there and really looking at your trees. And if you notice a change, then question it. You know, is this normal? Is this something that I should get some help on? You know, besides our division, there are uh, district foresters out there that can, you know, do walks in the woodlot and say, yeah, this, you know, this might need some attention or no, it's, it's nothing to worry about. It's one of the best things you can do is to encourage diversity, a diversity of species, diversity of age classes, diversity of structure. You have some ability to escape damage. The good news in Maine is that we have forests that do fairly well at regenerating after those disturbances. And the worries, as far as that's concerned, is things like your invasive plants that may outcome to heat that natural regeneration with a big disturbance event. I got involved when I was at the Maine Forest Service and we started thinking about how do we manage forests to reduce climate change? So there are big unknowns, but there are also big knowns that we do know how to deal with. We can increase carbon storage in the forest by growing trees in longer rotations uh, and making sure that we minimize soil disturbance as we're doing harvesting. And you should be trying to grow species that are going to be well suited to future climates like you'll notice here on my property what am i emphasizing i'm emphasizing oaks and pines and that's because that's what we expect is going to do the best uh, in this part of the world in the future you have to look at all the interacting pieces this is a system that we have and it's a system that we use to provide materials and if we don't have wood materials then we're going to use something else and those other things all consume uh, far more energy and hence have greater greenhouse gas emissions. 
So it takes 10 times as much energy to produce a steel stud as it does a wooden stud. And if, so if we substitute wood for other construction materials, we really could be providing a huge benefit. People think, oh, I did a wonderful thing because I set aside this piece of woods and I'm not gonna ever harvest anything from it. If we don't harvest it here, where we can see it, where we can, we have regulations to control it, uh, and where it's close by so we're not transporting it all over the world, uh, you're just shifting the uh, impact to someplace, someplace else. You're not avoiding the impact. You may be avoiding the impact to you. You don't have to look at the harvest that occurs, but you're not avoiding the impact. You can increase the carbon stocks in the forest over time. You can have ups and downs as you go along, but increase the carbon stocks in the forest over time and increase the rate of growth and the, pro and the uh, harvest of timber to substitute for other materials. There are a lot of regulations that affect forestry in Maine. It can get very complicated depending on where you are. There's laws pertaining to boundary lines, to slash or brush along roadsides, public ways. There's the water quality laws. There's shoreland zoning um, in towns. There's also what's known as statewide standards for timber harvesting in towns. So those are the water quality buffers and it's often advisable to get some help from a, a resource that really understands them. Um, like a consulting forester or getting advice from the Maine Forest Service or an entity like that. Forestry is complicated. Forests are complicated. Um, getting the outcomes you want that are going to make you happy um, can be complicated to do. Um, and not every forest is in a condition that you can push it all the way to where it wants to be or where you want it to be um, right now. It's a long, it's a long term process. A forester, in addition to providing on the ground management help, can also educate a landowner about to what's out there. Preparing a management plan is something that a landowner might think, I own this land, but what do I do with it? Where do I start it? The whole thing is kind of overwhelming. And a forester can help you set priorities for the work that's done and generally make a plan for a 10-year period. And a forester can also do a timber inventory to help you know what is on your land, what are the volumes and values of trees, and also a whole host of other things like what, are, what wildlife species might be living there, what are some potential insect and disease problems, uh, invasive plants, if there's anything like that around that needs to be addressed, any uh, soil erosion or water quality concerns. A forester looks at all those things and assesses them and makes recommendations either for protection or changing things or some other kind of stewardship activity. Forest health can be defined in different ways and it's really a matter of finding a balance between ecological health and what humans think of as a healthy forest as well and managing for both of those. Most landowners really do have a multiple obje objectives for their property. You can manage a forest for timber and actually enhance wildlife values and provide income. Then it's a matter of finding what's the right balance for each individual landowner and each individual woodlot. But it, these multiple objectives certainly aren't exclusive. This is an area that has just recently been harvested in the past few weeks. And you can see it's a selection harvest. There's a few painted trees that are left around that he still needs to cut. But basically trying to thin out the canopy to get a little bit more sunlight on the ground to encourage regeneration and to take out the low quality trees and leave the better trees with more room to grow. Remember, we have 20 species in the Acadian forest, and sure, we can let that come back. That's what nature would have done, right? But nature was starting with the full suite. When we're starting with these forests that have been heavily exploited in the past, or they might just be old field forests on your small landowners, right? A lot of that's old field vegetation, missing a lot of the pieces. Um, I'm unapologetic about the benefits of management, right? That's what silviculture is, is to give us, is to help us have the kind of forest that we want, whether that be for 
just aesthetic and hunting enjoyment while watching wildlife or to make some money or ideally do both at the same time. We talk about partial harvesting or uneven aged or even aged management. All those things are very technical. But once you've gone into the woods and you can say, okay, I see what this looks like. I understand whether this is what I do want or what I don't want. So looking at the outcomes in the forest is useful for connecting folks to a better understanding of forest management. So I know where all the trees are, and all the measurements are, and how they're growing fast, and that's how you learn. The best way to learn is to ask questions and try it yourself. I love my forest. I love learning everything. Doesn't matter what it is.